Uh, good evening, uh, one and all. Welcome here to the RIBA's excellent uh, building. Um, what I want to do is just say a few, few words at the beginning just to introduce uh, this evening, and then I'll talk briefly about our distinguished lineup of speakers. Then I'll move over there, and each of the speakers can uh, talk for a while, and then we can open it up after they've spoken uh, to a wider debate. I just want to begin by saying a few words about cities. Uh, cities are increasingly where the world lives. You'll often see figures uh, quoted that say now 75% of the world uh, live in cities, and if they don't, they soon will. Um, we're seeing, interestingly, live, if you live here in London or visit some of the older developed cities, they are re-urbanizing at the same time as in much of the developing world, cities are growing at an extraordinary rate. So we've got urbanization going on both in old and new cities. Living in large metropolises has always been a complex and difficult thing. You depend much more if you live in a city on infrastructure, on good government, on logistics, uh, than if you live in a rural area, for obvious reasons. Failure of these things leads to very bad things very quickly. Whereas if you're in a rural area, and I'm not underplaying the difficulties of living there, these things you can do without them for longer. Now, we're living in a world where there are new challenges, such as higher energy prices and indeed changes to the whole global financial and economic system, changes to the climate, international migration, conflict, and so on, all of which affect the way cities work. And, of course, they create challenges which can go from the apparently banal, from the way we use roads, to the very, very challenging, which is how to use leading-edge technology. Cities have to adapt to cope. They have to look at issues, they have to look at technology, they have to look at how to innovate. They have to consider better or smarter government. And they have to do this in the service of allowing tens of millions of people, because that's what you get in very large cities now, sometimes 20s and 30s of millions of people, living together. And all of this is in the service of allowing them to live together more comfortably, more efficiently, and in a fulfilled way, but to do so in often very tight proximity. And that's what tonight's all about. It's how to allow this to happen in smarter cities. And we have speakers who are going to address a number of issues, such as connectivity, leadership, visionary government versus pragmatism, and the need for energy efficiency. Uh, and I hope we're going to hear not only all these things, but things that go slightly beyond the way we normally uh, think of the development of cities. Now, we've got a distinguished lineup of speakers, as I said. You've got all their details in the pack in front or in the paper in front of you, but just very briefly, Adam Newton from the Shell Scenarios team, Rick Robinson from IBM Smarter Cities, Sunan Prasad, a leading architect, and joining us from uh, Bogota is Enrique Penalosa. Good evening, Enrique. Lovely to see you. Very good to see you, Tony. Good to see you again. And uh, Enrique, of course, was former mayor of uh, Bogota. So, without further ado, what I want to do is to move on to our first speaker, uh, who is Adam Newton, who is projects manager in the, Strel, uh, the Shell Strategy and Scenarios team. So, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Newton. Good evening, everyone. I'm slightly embarrassed about being called distinguished, particularly in front of the former mayor of Bogota and the former uh, chairman of the Royal Institute of British Architects. But thank you, Tony, for the uh, invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you all also for coming out on a Monday evening um, to this important debate and discussion. As Tony mentioned, this is an interesting and important week for Shell. Last week in Washington, uh, we launched our latest global scenarios. And in Shell, we've been using scenario planning as a, uh, a reinforcement tool for the strategic planning process uh, since the early 1970s. It's a process which allows us, in a sense, to future-proof the decisions we make about the business to today uh, against the, what the world may look like in 40 years' time. 
And the approach brings a more interactive and human uh, a dimension to those strategy discussions by asking a series of what-if questions uh, about the impact of known events, but also about uncertainties uh, as they play out over the future. And so being here this evening uh, to talk about cities is particularly opportune, uh, both because it gives us um, what we hope will be a valuable opportunity uh, to engage um, a new audience of people in the New Lens scenario content. I've seen many people carrying the books around. There are copies outside for those who don't have them. Uh, it's also available from the iTunes store and for download from the Shell website. But also to say a little bit about the work that we've been doing on cities over the past uh, couple of years uh, and their impact on human development. Uh, Tony's already talked about uh, the extent of urban development. The statistics are truly startling. In a world population of 9 billion people by the middle of this century, almost every single additional person on the planet uh, between now and 2050 will be accounted for in a city. And that's a growth rate which is an absolutely staggering 1.3 million people a week. And when factored up, amounts to about eight new Londons every year for the next 40 years. So I think it would be no understatement to say that urbanization represents possibly the biggest single social and demographic disruption of the early 21st century. But as hundreds of millions of people move out of poverty for the first time, the world's uh, precious resources will become increasingly stressed. And cities will be the place where those stresses aggregate. About 80% of all energy consumed in the world will be done so in cities and roughly the same proportion of emissions generated. And of course, associated problems with the quality of air and water, shortages of available land for food production, and of course, things like congestion from vehicles are all well-known uh, uh, subjects. And new lens scenarios are, are called new lens because we've used a number of emergent, uh, um, I guess I'd call them contradictions, uh, which we refer to as lenses, as things which under, underpinning uh, civil society uh, and global decision making. And I just want to spend a few minutes just talking about some of those. First of all, our paradox lenses, which are uh, embodying current tensions and are highlighting key features in the emerging landscape. And the first of those is a prosperity paradox, which illustrates both how economic development raises living standards, but can also bring stresses, environmental, financial, social, and political, which have the capacity to undermine the benefits of wealth creation. If we bring that back to cities, cities with abundant resources grow historically in quite an organic way and have a tendency to sprawl unless there are specific constraints, and we think of places like Singapore or Hong Kong, which inhibit the growth uh, uh, of the city footprint. And that sprawl has the tendency to lock in deep energy and resource inefficiency into the infrastructure, which is incredibly costly and difficult to re-engineer. Poorer crowded cities will also run the same risk, clearly for different reasons, if, as many do, many do they also follow an organic development pathway. Turning then to the second paradox in connectivity. Connectivity facilitates individual expression and empowerment, but also encourages herd behavior. It amplifies swings uh, in confidence and demand. And the burgeoning availability of information has the capacity both to bring insight and transparency, but with an overload of data, you're equally likely to generate confusion and doubts about authenticity and trust. Now, again, in the context of cities, government have to offer incentives and sanctions for smart growth, with business playing a much greater role in creating smarter, integrated solutions in areas like energy, uh, like housing information, uh, mobility, water, and waste. And so civil society, as well, has to be depart, uh, a part of that trade-off, but in a demand sense, uh, between this state of conspicuous consumption of goods and the inevitable impact that that consumption has on resources. So to prosper, all groups must work together in a connected way. And finally, the leadership paradox. Addressing the global stresses that we see today requires coordination amongst an increasing number of constituencies of decision makers. But the more diverse the groups that are involved, the more that vested interests tend to block progress. There's an often cited African proverb, one you're probably aware of, which suggests that to go fast, you need to go alone, but to go far, you should go together. Grappling with the growing stresses that we see requires that we both go fast and far, which implies a paradoxical need to go alone 
and together. So for city leaders um, that consider problems too hard to solve or solutions too popular to execute, stresses in cities will often be ignored until a state where livability in those cities uh, is compromised. And the gulf between uh, electoral and infrastructure time horizons is one which is enormously hard to bridge. And yet bridging it is absolutely necessary for healthy urban development. Moving to our pathway lenses, these describe different ways in which individuals and groups behave under stresses or when facing uh, situations of crisis. Some will exhibit resilience that creates positive economic and social capital. It enables them to adapt and reform. And a good example of this in the context of the scenario work is the response of the BRIC economies in the first wave of economic volatility from the global banking crisis in 2008. And we call that trend, uh, that process, room to maneuver. Others, meanwhile, struggle in a state of denial or paralysis as crisis escalates. And they start to use responses uh, which, rather than solving uh, the situation, um, actually aggravate the long-term prognosis and typically end in a state of dramatic write-off or reset. And this is a state that we've called trap transition. Again, contemporary examples of this include the Eurozone nations and their failure to make significant process towards stabilizing uh, the indebted economies of, of Greece and other European nations. Or from a completely different perspective, um, but nonetheless relevant to the trap transition archetype, the response of the Assad regime to popular uprising in Syria. And again, by applying the behavioral archetypes I've just described uh, to cities, it's possible to see how they too can be routinely impacted by the pace and efficiency with which decisions are taken in order to address the stresses. In Room to Maneuver, we see visionary leadership creating innovative coalitions of public and private sectors which shape growth and progress in cities. Decision makers identify stresses and they intervene early to invoke swift solutions or form collaborations. And structural solutions follow quickly in areas like compact urban development, mass transit systems, and integrated technologies like combined heat and power or indeed district heating schemes. And we tend to think about smart cities in terms of technological solutions. But of course, smartness is also a factor in how policy thinking uh, is translated into decision-making behavior. In trap transition, meanwhile, market forces dictate growth with the outcome often being infrastructure sprawl and inefficiency uh, locked in very, very early. Authorities, assuming that problems are too hard to tackle, uh, don't uh, create the conditions for solutions, uh, believing that they will be too unpopular to implement. Stresses become ignored until livability is threatened, and the results of that process are often too plain to see, with cities starting to fail, typified by crime and disorder, by urban decay, people moving out of the cities, and problems associated with corruption and, and, and of course, economic decline. I'd like to share briefly with you before concluding some of the work that we've been doing on urban China. By the end of 2010, the Chinese urban population was existed, uh, estimated, excuse me, at 660 million people. By 2030, an additional 300 million people are expected to have joined the urban ranks of China by, my, by migration or birth. Now, according to McKinsey, as many as a quarter of total global growth in liquid fuel demand in the next 20 years is expected just to come from China's cities. Shell's been working in China for some time, and we've recently considered urbanization there as part of uh, a project which has looked more broadly at the future energy needs of the country. And one of the key insights, and I think one of the most exciting things that that study was able to find, is that by focusing on density alone uh, uh, in small to medium-sized cities, and we're talking about creating um, density roughly equal to the average density of London or, or the density of Paris, it could be possible to contain all urban growth in China to 2030 within the existing urban footprint. We looked at something like 480 cities of, of 100,000 to half a million people uh, in looking at this. And that move alone would save an estimated 75,000 square kilometers of arable land in a country which is crying out uh, for arable land. And that's an area almost the size of Scotland. And in doing so, it would create the conditions uh, by which energy could be reduced and emissions impacted. Worldwide, compact design and development and more mass transit 
could achieve an average saving of 2,000 kilometer vehicle, uh, uh, vehicle kilometers per capita. And yet today, the picture on urban mobility is patchy. Here in Europe, we average about 10% uh, uh, of journeys taken by public transport. Hong Kong is by far and away the most outstanding uh, uh, result, with about 90%. And even in Singapore, which uh, people point to in terms of their integrated transport uh, infrastructure, about 50% of all commuted trips are taken uh, by metro and bus. In Atlanta, it's 1%. And that reflects an urban footprint which was developed during the last century, we believe, around assumptions of how much fuel would cost and how much fuel would be available. To achieve a sustainable urban future, fresh forms of collaboration are required, and they need to cut across the familiar national, public, private, and industry sector boundaries. There are currently no strong models for such collaborations, and they are immensely difficult to get off the ground. And the reason for that is because different parties involved in trying to achieve them have their, their, their um, focus uh, principally on the foreground issues and the responsibilities um, that they are concerned with um, right in front of them. So a question perhaps for further discussion this evening will be how do we harness the power of the private sector um, from, from our perspective to be a positive agent for change in cities? I think from those of us here representing companies today there is no shortage of experience in handling the sort of scale infrastructure and information systems projects that are needed, but we don't have the current business models uh, which enable us uh, to work together in this way around the development in cities, even if we can, and I'm sure we can, see the enormous financial upside associated with working on the future of urban development. So with increased wealth comes expectation. And the lesson from the developed world is that that in inexorable growth in demand for goods and services increases reliance on uh, energy and adds to a resource stress problem. Urban livability is partially served through increasing environmental standards and their requirements for more technically advanced solutions come at an enormous cost premium. And the perception gap today between what people expect to pay for resources and what they actually cost is extremely wide. I hope that this brief overview of some of our thinking demonstrates the value in making cities a focus. If the issues which are associated with city development are ignored and that can keep, uh, um, we keep in a situation where the can is, is kicked down the road, then I'm afraid that all too soon the problems that are associated uh, um, with urban development um, will see flexibility in the system lost as bad decisions or frankly no decisions get taken and rigidity becomes locked into um, bad infrastructure. If we can succeed in getting government, society and business working to be to better together, however, then cities could provide the hope for a sustainable planet uh, of nine billion people. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, I hope, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak and, and um, for allowing Shell's continued involvement in this process. And I look forward to the conversation. I'm just going to flick through the sides I forgot to flick through during the uh, presentation. But thank you very much. Before you uh, get away too lightly, let me, um, let me just ask a question. I mean, you, you spoke towards the end about the power of the private sector, and clearly uh, Shell's a very large private company, but there'll, there'll be others here represented. Now, in the world that we're discussing, city government, city governance, is always at some level in this complicated, growth-driven, uh, very sort of challenging urban environment, government's going to have to spend a lot of time stopping people doing things they want. Obviously, it has to facilitate them, but it also has to stop them sprawling, travelling in vehicles that are bad for the environment, and, and, and. Now, do you not feel that for the private sector to get involved in the sordid and awkward business of helping politicians who are elected to be unpopular risks the private sector's environment, um, reputation? Well, I, th I think there'd be people in the audience that would, um, um, would, would um, 
view the private sector's involvement in all manner of activities in, in uh, engagement with government at a, at, a, at a national or local level to be, uh, uh, um, well, may have a mixed impression about it. I mean, I, for me... But I'm I saying that the business is, you know, <laughs> on balance, worried about its own reputation. Politicians are almost always, you know, apart from the week they're elected, unpopular. So I'm saying is a sort of risk to the private sector in trying to help in these complex... Because it's all rationing. In I, end, I, I, think, I think there is, of course, a risk inherent in it, as there is in a lot of business activities. But I would go back to some and pretty fundamental research that was done on the scale of the opportunity associated with involvement in, in city development. In fact, I think the, the gentleman and, and his colleagues who are involved in that are here in the audience this evening. And, and based on the assumption that two-thirds of urban infrastructure required by the middle of this century is yet to be built, the mind-boggling figure of $300 trillion associated with urban development uh, in the coming period will, will need to be found. So when I talk about the absence of business models which make it possible for Shell working with IBM uh, to find a way of unlocking uh, access to some kind of that value, of course there's a commercial self-interest associated mm. in that. But, but on the point of, of, of reputation or tarnishing thereof, I, I, I suspect that's not actually the, the, the kind of the key issue. And... Well, that's uh, encouraging, really. I mean, as far as city governments are concerned, I mean, do you find them or do you think they are likely to be amenable to ideas you can bring them from the private sector and other private companies can bring them from the private sector? Right, I think the notion that, that local government is already switched on to working with the private sector in, in uh, um, many spheres is, is, is a misnomer. I think there is an opportunity um, to work with visionary government that understands the need for long-term planning um, as businesses like ours have to if we want to be a business in 30 years' time uh, to recognise the, the, the scale of the bigger opportunity. Mm. It will not be easy, and in certainly in, in cases, I think Mayor Penalosa is the person to, to talk about that, uh, will not necessarily be popular. But my fear is if we don't take these decisions soon in the next five to ten years, then the issue of lock-in will, will really cripple so many cities at the time when this growth will really determine whether or not cities will be part of the solution or an ongoing part of a problem that we can all recognise. Okay. Well, Adam, for now, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and our next speaker this evening is... Sunand Prasad, who is a senior partner in an architectural practice and, crucially given the building we're in, former president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Between uh, Shell and IBM, I'm a very thin filling in a very fat sandwich. Um, I thought that I would examine, actually, what would be really smart in a city. Uh, what is a smart city? And that's partly, uh, as someone who's been a bit of a bystander, although familiar with the, with the idea and the trope of smart city for some years, uh, it's, it's only recently that I really started thinking, what is a smart city? So here's, here are some ideas, thoughts about smart cities. Well, first of all, obviously, the smart city is a, is a proxy. It's a, it's a paradigm for something else. Uh, it's, it's a trope. And it sums up a huge range of desirables of many kinds. And it's, in that sense, quite like sustainability, really. It's hard to disagree with the proposition that cities should be smart, just like you can't disagree with that they should be sustainable. Uh, and there's always something slightly worrying when you can't disagree with the proposition. Um, Someone once described sustainability as the slipperiest piece of soap in the shower. But at least we know what it is in practice. This is one of the great things about sustainability. We know what it is in practice. We understand it, although theoretically it's difficult to construct a waterproof uh, you know, framework around it. But smart is even more slippery. Uh, and for some, it's all about digitally connected infrastructure that can help operate urban systems you know, and deliver goods to the citizens even before they know them. Uh, they can uh, collect huge amounts of data, uh, and uh, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's a very technological vision. In contrast to these, uh, there are some who stress the social and community dimension, governance and empowerment, and others focus on jobs, competitiveness, growth catalyzed through programs to create a more skilled population. All of these are fantastic. And actually, many of the ideas that uh, circle around the 
uh, the, the world of the smart city are, are brilliant ideas. Uh, I just don't know necessarily whether they're smart. Uh, they're, they're, they can be brilliant and very good, but I want to develop an idea where I, I would like to suggest that um, changing the slides is a good idea. Um, I'd like to suggest that, um, that there is actually, throughout urban history, a fantastic number of brilliant ideas and fantastic ideas. And, and what's great is that they, they continue to arise. And that's one of the things that cities are, are really uh, birthplaces of, of fantastic ideas and new ways of living. And that's actually one of the, one of the great things about cities, uh, the, the fact that through uh, agglomeration of, of minds, new things are produced. Here's a city of Jaisalmer founded in the 12th century on the Silk Route in the middle of nowhere. And it thrived really because of its position the Silk Route. It was able to do pretty rich and you know, quite often illicit trade. Uh, opium comes to mind, for example. And uh, however, within its defensible walls, there were some uh, extraordinary uh, feats of civilization uh, performed. Uh, it rained five days a year. And despite that, people lived reasonably opulent lives, uh, relying on a very technologically advanced rainwater collection and distribution system, uh, not to mention the remarkably high tolerance of heat that the, uh, the, the citizens developed. Um, there it is in the, the, the old, the, the, the lumpy part there is actually the, uh, the old citadel uh, and then there's a, there's a bit of minor sprawl around it, not very much. This is the, the water collection tank which, is, uh, which actually manages to keep the city in water around the whole year. Uh, a culture of, an uh, urban culture of around 40,000 people built up, it's now about 80,000. It had fantastic sophistications. Uh, including information systems based on songs that you might hear coming from, from homes, which is reminiscent of the way that Richard Sennett, for example, <coughs> has described the, uh, the 18th century and 19th century cities. And these songs, for example, would tell you what was going on in a house, what kind of, you know, if there were particular rituals or uh, big events in life, births, deaths, marriages, very great detail about what was going on. Uh, it's kind of social media, really, uh, without the internet. And uh, uh, you know, I don't say that to belittle uh, social media, actually, quite the reverse. Social media feeds on this uh, um, natural tendency within us. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, or quite soon after, there's a beautiful place there, look. Um, here's Jaipur, which is 575 kilometers away in a more fertile part of Rajasthan. I thought I'd just take a very really small part of the world, a relatively small part of the world, and just see what, what went on here. Uh, it's a city planned on a grid uh, with a uh, great understanding of both canonic principles but also modern ideas. It had a huge uh, infrastructure of dealing with flash floods and storms, uh, which actually, as a result of disrepair, is now not performing as well as it used to. Uh, uh, and later in the 19th century, it had a railway sewage system. And uh, you know, one of the greatest things about this place is that it works tremendously functionally normally, but it becomes a theater, a spectacle, because of the way the streets are configured, the way the buildings are either side. The street becomes a, a theater for special events. It's, a, it, it's, it's the cityest of cities, you know, and it's something that's very, uh, very much uh, to be loved about them, and we, we have our own versions of these. You know, London's sewers and the work of Bazalgette, who created a, a, the sewage system that put an end to cholera. It started the cleaning up, clean up of the Thames uh, and anticipated, actually, amazingly, the future scale of demand in London. It was very visionary and forward-looking, and, of course, the London Underground, um, which is, uh, there's the sewers of Bazalgette, the, this great drawing of the London Underground and appearing in stamps, digging underneath the, 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 the city, you know, 150 years ago, uh, and these beautiful stations, and the maps too, on the left, the original map, and on the right, one of the great feats of graphic design, um, which is the modern underground map. Um, and so these ideas continue. Now, Amsterdam, which is... Uh, Ad advertise itself as Amsterdam's smart city. Uh, it's it's actually it's um, um, putting in place a very large number of uh, separate projects uh, under the banner of smart, and it categorizes smart in these five categories: 
living, working, mobility, public facilities, and open data. The last one is, of course, particularly interesting, uh, as well, of course, as investing in, in infrastructure. But I would, uh, well, let's just quickly look at those. Um, it's a very nice website, actually, the Amsterdam one. Do have a look. And there are, every one of these is, is a great idea, and many of those are bottom-up, and of course, the bottom-up and top-down is one of the big poles of discussion about smart. But I want to suggest that actually, a bundle of things isn't what smart should really be about. And I'm going to suggest that there are five things that smart is really about. Smart is selecting, uh, is, is joining up, Oh, sorry, I want to say one thing about data before I do that, and just a stunning example of the ubiquity of data. These are uh, checkout. This is checkout activity in Manhattan supermarkets just before and just after uh, Superstorm Sandy. And these uh, are uh, gleaned from credit card companies, from banks. So nobody went out and measured this, but just from the way people are using the credit cards, you can see immediately how Lower Manhattan has been completely paralyzed by Superstorm Sandy. And this is, is an example of the level of, of data that is available to us, uh, if only we knew fully how to use it. And I'll, I'll close with that point. Smart is joining up or integrating packages of economic, social, and technological measures so that they work together. For example, planning development or uh, writing development guidance to take into account uh, infrastructure development and its consequences, such as the impact of increased property values, for example, can be factored into, into development and uh, forward projections. Smart, that's number one. Smart is selecting and scaling programs appropriate to each city and town. One thing that has emerged recently is just, uh, you know, especially in the UK, through the work of the Centre for Cities, of whom I'm a trustee and Tony uh, is, is, um, chairs the research panel, or has done, is how different cities are from each other and how the idea that they can all converge to similar levels of growth and so on is not really tenable. And have a look at the, the Centre for Cities uh, City Facts uh, um, app which actually helps you to understand the differences between UK cities in great detail. And it's these differences and this adaptation of measures to actually the scale and the opportunities really in the city is what I would uh, call smart. In some places, for example, you would actually suggest that there'll be zero growth. But rather than lament the zero growth, how do we deal with that? Now, that would be smart. Smart is joining up with other cities so that the learning spreads. Uh, these this beautiful graphic, by the way, is a, is a, is a diagram of, of inter worldwide internet connections. Uh, you can just about see the world emerging underneath that. Uh, so some organizations fear, uh, not so much cities necessarily, the idea of sharing too much information on grounds of competitiveness. But that era of hoarding intellectual property is surely over. And I think one of the, one of the features of the smart city will be open data, open sharing of, of data in this way. Uh, but actually, it does come with a caution, uh, and I think it requires a kind of a citizenry that is able to, to properly use it. Smart is, this is the hardest bit, smart is thinking uh, in the long term, even when acting in the short term. Uh, now, there's a pair of short-termist uh, actions here. Uh, one is uh, building the highway without getting the proper permissions, and the other is being so stubborn that you won't move, um, just built in China. Um, this is, this is the hardest part of SMART, I think. All the arguments made by organizations like the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, the RIBA, of course, uh, for considering long-term value in designing and constructing buildings are now falling on deaf ears in an era where immediate costs have become the key, key criterion for, um, uh, for public sector contract award. Yes, planning has its unforeseen consequences and more unintended consequences than than intended ones sometimes, but SMART knows what to plan and what to leave alone. So for example, we have to plan, great, we have to plan, uh, we have to plan for climate change, uh, but there's no point in going berserk and installing uh, immature technologies in buildings in an effort to make them zero carbon uh, now, because that will actually have another kind of lock-in effect, which is it'll inhibit future change to those. Smart would be to start changing people's and corporate behavior and use public money and purchasing power to kickstart a market and energy efficiency retrofit, which will also provide jobs. 
a market of the scale that's needed will generate innovations and mature technologies uh, to take us to the next step. And finally, smart is, and this, I have to say this, and I believe it passionately as an architect and, um, and some, some, uh, an urbanist, we have to recognize what a huge difference the quality of cities, buildings, and spaces makes to people's lives. Everyone recognizes that the quality of opportunities and services is critical to people's happiness, but we don't give enough attention to the settings in which these are delivered, uh, however much we think we do. It wasn't always the case. Look at the pictures I showed earlier. Top-down diktats regarding the design quality of buildings can only go so far. In the long term, we have to, as citizens, become more critical and more empowered thereby more aware of our surroundings. And education from primary school onwards has a big role to play in increasing people's awareness of the visible and invisible structures that surround them, so that as digital networks and open data becomes ubiquitous, we actually, as citizens, are smart enough to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Sanand. Um, you talk at the end about open data and the way in which it can make cities function in a smarter way, in a more efficient way. Clearly, you showed the tube map, which clearly allowed people in London to make new decisions about how to get around this city when previously they'd had the other map, which wouldn't have helped very much. Uh, and there was also the Amsterdam example of trying to help people to think rather differently about where they worked. But I suppose the question about data, and you hinted at it yourself, is how democratic it is. I mean, who, who has access to it? Lots of people will want to use these data to, uh, for commercial ends, and therefore will defend them. So how, how's, how, how, how are the citizenry and governments to have access to data in the widest sense that can help them help people live these smarter lives? I think that's a very good question that I'm not sure I'm... Uh, able to entirely answer, but I would just make one observation, which is that generally secrecy, secrecy of data is overstated. Generally, it's not always. Uh, there are some pretty un bad unintended consequences that I've personally experienced in organizations just from the Freedom of Information Act. But I nevertheless defend the act, although it has those uh, unintended consequences, such as people starting to now hold meetings in, in much greater secrecy and writing very terse minutes so that when the, they, the uh, minutes are made available, nobody can really tell what was going on. But, um, so, but, but I think it is generally overstated, that case. The second thing is that I think that, this is my last point, which is, was my last point, which is that we actually have to ourselves, as citizens, become uh, <coughs> more capable of understanding and using the data and knowing when it matters and when it doesn't. And a lot of uh, FOR requests, for example, are actually not really for information, they're for other reasons. And so as citizens, we too hold some of these numbers, uh, some of this data as well, don't we? I mean, some of the data that cities might use is held by people using their smartphones and tracking their smartphones even more interestingly yeah. and complicatedly. Yeah, I anyway. agree with that. Okay, thank you, Sanand. Thank you very much. And next, we're going to hear from Rick Robinson, executive architect for IBM's Smarter Cities program. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I shouldn't have a problem remembering to move my slides on because I've set them to move on automatically. We'll <laughs> see if I uh, manage to keep up with them. Um, I'm going to start with my four and a half year old son. Um, if I'm lucky, by the time I die, he'll be about the age that I am now. Um, if I could see him now as he'll be then, I really don't know the degree to which I'll recognize his behavior as human. A couple of years ago, uh, I bought a touchscreen tablet. I showed him a cartoon on it. When it had finished, he pressed the thumbnail of the cartoon that he wanted to watch next. That correct and instinctive action, I think, has profound implications. And it's just the start of what I think of as the disappearance of the boundary between the physical world and information systems. Um, this headset that I'm wearing in the bottom right can uh, interpret the magnetic waves created by my thoughts and draw instructions from those 
magnetic waves and can give them as commands to computer systems. A woman has controlled a robotic arm using this technology. Um, <clears throat> so my thoughts can influence the world of information. And the world of information can influence the physical world, whether that's through sensors and actuators implanted in our own bodies, as Professor Kevin Warwick has been experimenting with in, in Reading for many years now, or whether it's through 3D printing physical objects such as prosthetic limbs, um, or even living tissues such as skin and muscle fibers, both of which have been printed from individual cells using these techniques. So we've become used, I think, to, over the past few decades, um, information technology disrupting our communications. Um, <laughs> From the telephone to email um, to social media, they've changed more and more quickly. As these technologies become more everyday, they're going to change the way we interact with the physical world in, in striking ways, and that's going to happen more quickly too. And these striking capabilities occur at a time that we have the striking ch challenges um, that we've been hearing about in the context of our cities. We, we started building cities upwards around the lifts powered by the steam engine invented by James Watt and commercialized by Matthew Bolton in Birmingham in the Industrial Revolution. Then for the last century, as we've just heard, we've been building them outwards around the car. A, a question and our choice is what happens as we start building these cities around the information systems that are available. And I think we can feel some of the challenges we need to address right now, as well as the price of energy um, going up. The price of food has gone up relative to income uh, in the last few years. And that's because we have competition for the world's grain between growing populations needing food and needing fuels such as bioethanol. Um, so we have real choices to make in how we address these challenges and how we try to use them to use these capabilities to fashion a society that's ethical and sympathetic to us as human beings. And I think there are three trends we can look to urbanism and technology and the research of resilient systems in solving them. The first is for little things and big things to work together. So I've got on this page some interventions in the physical environment in cities, starting with Birmingham's Ring Road, constructed to support the post-war economy so that cars could get around the city. But it physically strangled the growth of the city centre. It wasn't compatible with the needs of the little people who lived there. We're now experimenting with Exhibition Road, which knits the city together in London, or this elevated pedestrian roundabout in China, which protects the fluidity of movement of walking and, bu and riding bicycles, modes of transport in which it's easy to stop and interact with city systems. So these are big infrastructures which are compatible with the needs of the little people and inhabit the city around them um, who, and who are the reason for its existence. The same challenge applies to technology infrastructures. We can do a lot with inf information in cities. We can measure the position of cars and the concentration of carbon monoxide. We can turn that into information about how fast traffic is flowing and about the level of emissions from buildings. And we can turn that into insight about a city's performance, the impact on life expectancy of the quality of the environment or the impact of congestion on the economy. And as a result, cities are rushing to invest in 3G and 4G and broadband infrastructures to move all of this data about. But the danger is that these are the big infrastructures of the information age. What use is broadband connectivity in an area with low economic activity if the people and businesses there can't afford subscriptions to it? Or if they don't have the computer programming skills that you need to make sense of data and draw uses from it? How can we adapt these big information infrastructures to the needs of little people, little organizations, and communities? So the place to start is not with infrastructure, it's with places and people. The infrastructures that are successful in doing this aren't just deployed, they're co-created in a process of design by listening to communities. It requires us to visit new places like the Container City um, Incubation Facility for Social Enterprise in Sunderland and uh, learn new language and learn new values such as the triple bottom line of social, environmental and financial capital that social enterprises audit themselves against. In Dublin, this process has led to a collaboration between the City Council and the surrounding county councils, the National University of Ireland, and public and private sector providers to the city, where 3,000 data sets are now being shared about systems such as the city's water supply and transportation. It's yielding research insight into new ways that the city's systems can behave and how its water system can support new houses without any increase in physical capacity. And it's leading to all these innovations similar to Amsterdam, in new applications, some of which are now um, being started by businesses winning venture capital to, to, back, uh, to back them. 
And so by engaging in a process like this, you enable de the design of services that can become part of the fabric of life and enable new choices um, and inform those choices based on the impact that they're about to have. Um, in, a proje in projects in uh, Singapore, California and elsewhere, we've used algorithms that can predict the flow of traffic an hour in advance with about 85-90% accuracy, can tell you about how traffic flow and traffic volume are going to change and where congestion will occur in the future. In San Francisco, we gave that information to, compu to commuters every day so that before they set out on their journey, they were told how long that journey was likely to be and whether it would be impacted by congestion that perhaps hadn't occurred yet. That gives a new opportunity to choose, to take a different route to work, use a different mode of transport, travel at a different time, or even not to travel at all. And as well as appealing to selfish motivation, we can appeal to a sense of community and place. This is a smart water meter from Dubuque in Iowa, and it's showing information that can tell you whether your washing machine's working inefficiently because it needs servicing, or whether there's a, a weak underlying signal that shows that you've got a leak somewhere. And when we're given this information, to an extent, we choose to act on it. But something remarkable helped um, happened in a controlled experiment where some households were given the green points score that you see in the top right. That compares this household's conservation performance to an aggregate of its neighbours. And when we gave that information to people, they were literally twice as likely to, ch to make changes in their behaviour, resulting in an improvement in their conservation performance. And this isn't an isolated example. Other studies have shown a similar effect. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells us that once our personal, physical needs are taken care of, we care next about those around us, our families, our communities, and our peers. And we can design systems that appeal to them appeal directly to those values. And the information that we use to do, to do this is all around us. It's why the second trend appears, and we're all now producers and consumers of this information. Every time we share a photograph in social media, when we buy or sell in an online marketplace, or use a recommendation engine to find new music. As that boundary between the physical world and information systems disappears, we'll see new industries and markets disrupted in a similar way. Technology gives us the ability to create relationships in the supply chain, relationships between producers and consumers, much more flexibly and rapidly. We're seeing it already in food production, in transport resources such as journeys in cars and parking spaces, um, and we're seeing it in the, in the manufacture of custom goods. So the, the image on the bottom left is uh, taken from Shapeways, where you can 3D print pretty much anything that you like, and the cost of this technology is coming down. Um, at the same time, these marketplaces are transactional, and we've got interesting opportunities to affect the rate of ch exchange used in those transactions. Um, there's a, an alternative currency that's been in use in Switzerland for nearly 100 years now, the Weir, that's thought to have contributed to economic stability there. I suspect with someone from the LSE chairing the debate, we may have a, a comment on that. <laughs> um, five towns and cities in the UK um, have their own local currencies now, um, with similar intentions, and they're increasingly using um, advanced technology to support those currencies, such as the droplet smartphone payment system that's been created in, in Birmingham. These rates of exchange offer us the possibility to compare the complete cost of goods and services, the financial cost and their social and environmental implications, with dynamic, lo highly localized value to the participants, what it's worth to me now to have this service, rather than what it might be worth to me to have it in two weeks' time when I really need it. I think there's tremendous potential here to produce new information-based marketplaces that could support more sustainable city systems. But if they're such a good idea, why don't we have them ubiquitously already? And that comes down to something that's been mentioned by, by, the, other, by the other speakers. Um, where cities are making progress on this agenda, it's where they're coordinating the use of their public sector and private sector assets towards a co-created vision, towards a common set of goals and objectives. But in order to win that level of commitment, you don't only need the buy-in of the leaders and managers of those resources. You need the understanding of all of the stakeholders that they're accountable to, their employees, the electorates, their shareholders. 
To appeal to that tremendously broad set of interests, we need to, I think, to appeal to some common instincts amongst us all, a sense of narrative and our ability to empathise, rather than focus on the financial efficiencies created by smart infrastructures. And if we do that, we may not get very far because smart ideas cut across silos, so those who realise the benefits may not be those who are asked to make the investment in the first case. Um, instead, we should be concentrating on the social and personal and community value that can be created when people people can, can afford to buy better food, where they can afford to heat their homes properly in winter, when they have access to affordable transport to places of, of employment. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And so we need to start telling stories about how our lives in smarter cities might get better um, to, in order to win that support of people um, in donating their time and ultimately their resources towards creating them. <laughs> I'm pretty much done. Um, I think it's absolutely imperative for us to find these stories and to tell them because the changes that we face in coming decades are going to be so fast and so profound um, that cities who don't embrace them um, successfully um, won't, um, w won't succeed and could suffer not just stagnation but actually quite um, worrying levels of decline. Luckily, I think our ability to do so depends, in the first case, on a technology that's freely available to all of us, language used face-to-face -face in conversations. And personally, I can't think of a more essential challenge than to start using it to tell these stories about how our smarter cities could create a, fareable, uh, a, a fairer, more sustainable world. Thanks very much. What you've said begs the question of how cities and their governments, those who are responsible, help the broad mass of citizens come to terms with the kind of changes you've just outlined, or some of them. I mean, some of them are self-evident, but many of them uh, are not self-evident to many people and certainly not to people who are less uh, adept at handling technology. So I suppose the question that immediately springs to my mind is how, how should or would you imagine, how would you advise cities to handle the, all these very radical technological advances which will indeed shape the way cities develop and function? So um, a very similar question was, was asked in Birmingham's Smart City Commission um, and it was, was answered with the initially surprising response, have more cups of tea. Um, and this was from uh, an entrepreneur who's very successfully runs social media surgeries in, in Birmingham, has done for many years. Um, he simply goes to communities where they are and has conversations with them, um, and those conversations yield insight into how s social media could help those communities. And by approaching it in that very particular down-to-earth um, down to a simple way, um, he has constructive conversations that create new understanding. Um, it's a very soft idea, but I think a very important one. Does it matter that many of the people who run cities are perhaps less adept at using new technology than people 20 or 30 younger, <laughs> two years younger might be? Um, I think it does matter. I don't think it's necessarily an insurmountable problem. Um, I think the, the iPad example, the tablet example, is a very interesting one. I've seen all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life who I'd never imagined would walk into a meeting with a laptop, walk into a meeting with a touchscreen um, tablet, because it connects us to information in a way that's much more hum human and much less of a barrier. Um, so yes, I do think all of us need to be much more aware of technology and how it's used, but I don't think it's necessarily difficult to do that. Okay. Rick, thank you very much. Thank you. And last but by no means least, Enrique Penaloza joins us this evening from uh, Bogotá. Um, Enrique was mayor of Bogotá from 1998 to 2001 and transformed the city's uh, quality of life with a series of radical innovations. And here he is, Enrique Penaloza, good evening. Hello, Tony. Thank you very much. I will not talk about uh, such advanced technologies, uh, but clearly, uh, what is happening in the growth of uh, urban population is massive. We are having 70 million more people in cities every year. And uh, what is perhaps less understood is that cities will grow much more than proportional to that. 
For example, uh, a city like Bogota, where population is not growing so much, Bogota is the size of London, approximately 8 million, but it will at least treble its, its square meters built because homes will be smaller, and as societies become richer, uh, people need more city uh, per person, more offices, more gyms, more uh, restaurants, etc. So, uh, all over the world, we are going to be creating uh, totally new cities. And the challenge, I think, is to do uh, radically different and better cities. And I will talk about some very simple technologies. But uh, uh, I think cities are very, very wrong today in very structural ways. Uh, because we made cities uh, basically much more for cars. I mean, why are cities wrong? Because people are in fear, live in fear of getting killed. This is not a minor issue. If we tell any child today, anywhere in the world, watch out, a car, the child will jump in fright. Uh, and with a good reason, because tens of thousands of children are killed by cars every year all over the world. But the most amazing thing is not that this happens, but that we think this is normal, that this is progress. Uh, we have had cities for more than 10,000 years, and uh, for 10,000 years, any child could walk for blocks without any fear of uh, getting killed. This is only a matter of the last 80 years, and I think we have made some very profound structural mistakes in technology, in the technology of making cities. I hope that in the year 2200, and 13 people will say, how could people in those horrible 2013 cities? And as cities are going to be built in such massive scale over the next 30, 40 years, it will be a good time to make radical changes, which sometimes can be spring from very simple concepts. For example, in transport. Uh, in transport, uh, clearly we all want mass transit. But the uh, rail systems, subway systems are extremely expensive. So a city like Bogota, we adopted the system uh, invented in Curitiba, which is uh, buses on exclusive lanes. Uh, and these systems are based on democracy. The first article of every constitution in the world says that all citizens are equal before the law. If all citizens are truly equal before the law, a bus with 100 passengers has a right to a hundred times more road space than a car with one. But this is not so obvious when you try to implement this all over the world. Sometimes flagrant injustice is before our noses and we do not see it. For example, today we think that what happened in the French Revolution was very obvious. The changes in the French Revolution were very obvious. However, they were not so obvious because a thousand years had gone by and nothing had changed before. But let's not go so far uh, if, uh, in the past. Less than 100 years ago, women could not vote in the United Kingdom. And people thought this was perfectly normal. Uh, so almost our great grandfathers thought this was normal, that women should not vote. Now, I think that, for example, a John Road without exclusive lanes for buses is a symbol of lack of democracy. And it's a flagrant symbol of injustice. And it's a symbol of uh, technical incompetence. It does not take PhDs from Oxford or Cambridge. If we take a group of, a committee of 12 year old children, in half an hour, they will realize that the most efficient way of using scarce road space is in using exclusive lanes for buses. And so we created this system and our system, our bus system, the Transmillennium, is moving more passengers our direction, which is the way to measure the capacity of systems, than any subway in Europe. It's moving more passengers our direction than most subways in the world except for four or five. So, but this is a political challenge and a managerial challenge. So, uh, we are having cities again 70 million more inhabitants in cities every year. Uh, why don't we uh, create in these new cities a totally new different design? For example, to have hundreds of miles of bus-only roads, 
this would create fantastic transit systems at an extremely low cost. Roads only for buses, pedestrians, and bicycles. It would be so easy to introduce into the design. Or something else, I would ask the audience, how would your lives, your quality of life improve if within a few blocks from your home, you would enter a network of roads only for pedestrians and bicycles, but sort of bicycle highways hundreds of miles long. I would say the new city could be crisscrossed by hundreds and thousands of miles of pedestrian and bicycle only roads. We created in Bogota, for example, which is an extremely dense city, one of the most dense cities in the world, uh, more than 70, about 50 miles of uh, bicycle highways. And this completely changes life. We, th we could think of, of urban design where uh, people could have in every house, in every building, children could walk into a, into a, onto a greenway. One side of the, let's say, think of a city where one street, every other street would be pedestrian only. This is very easy to do when we are creating new cities. It's very difficult to do it in London or in the part of Bogota, which already exists. But in a new city, why one street only for pedestrians and bicycles, the next one for cars, traditional. These kind of things, which is very simple technologies, would completely change the life of people. It would be a totally different city and would be very easy to do. I'd like to mention that to, to end that this is not just the developing world, which is growing massively. In the United States, for example, if we take census numbers and if we assume that the homes, the households in the U.S. are going to become a little smaller, such as Germany's today, the United States will have to build 74 million new homes over the next 40 years. 74 million. This is more than the United Kingdom, France, Canada, and Australia put together has today in terms of homes. This is not China. This is the United States. But now... The question is, how are these cities going to grow? Everybody agrees today that low density suburbs, which is the uh, characteristic urban uh, structure of the United States, is not convenient for quality of life or environment. But also, most Americans don't want to live in Manhattan either. They don't want to live in high rises facing a narrow sidewalk and a street full of cars, which is dangerous, where people may get killed, which is noisy. So the question is, we need to build 74 million new homes in the United States, and whatever is done in the United States will have a huge influence in the rest of the world. How are these cities going to be built? So why not think of an American, new American city with, which is dense, with thousands of miles of greenways and pedestrian only roads crisscrossing it. A city which would be offer density with offering the same things that people seek in the suburbs, such as green and safe spaces for children to ride bicycles. A radically different design because clearly we are talking about technology. What we have in suburbs or what we have downtown Neither one of those works. So we clearly need to think of a different urban model. But the second question is not only how, but where are these cities going to be built in the United States? Clearly, it should not be built beyond the existing suburbs, far away beyond the existing suburbs. So where is where are these 74 million homes to be built? I would say the obvious answer would be to build demolishing, demolishing thousands, tens of thousands of hectares of existing suburbs which were, were well located. Why is the United States so important? Because this has a fan, an enormous influence on what is to happen all over the world. Uh, a, city, a city is only a means to a way of life. So designing a city, we really are designing ways of life. And whatever we are going to do over the next 40 or 50 years in developing countries will determine the world's sustainability, quality of life, and happiness for millions. 
I am absolutely convinced that radically new designs, uh, very different cities are possible. They are very simple. They are politically very difficult, but they could uh, lead us to have cities which are much more sustainable, where people will lead much happier lives. Thank you. Enrique, you were uh, mayor of a very large and complex city. Um, I made a point earlier to Adam about you know, the concern about, as you try to drive change, would a big company you know, want to throw its weight behind the complex business that politicians have to get involved with, which often which is unpopular. Um, I mean, how do politicians, how would you advise politicians to drive through the kind of changes you're describing? I mean, I think it's the first time I've heard anybody suggest knocking down large areas of US suburbs, so that's the first, I think. But I mean, seriously, how, what would you say to the mayor of a city whose suburbs you were proposing to knock down? How would you kind of get across the idea that this would be better for them in the long term? Well, uh, I think first of all, we have to dare think different. Because, uh, for example, many of these suburbs in the United States are completely collapsed. I've been, for example, only two, less than two miles from Birmingham downtown, where there is a very dynamic university. They are completely collapsed, hundreds of acres of collapsed suburbs. Uh, but uh, in the United States, maybe they are traumatized by Jane Jacobs, who said that it was terrible to do any demolitions and urban re redevelopment. But here we are talking almost about human survival, about global warming. And uh, maybe we'll have to act and not just see how many of these uh, cities uh, are totally unsustainable. Another argument for politicians is equity. I think that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, democracy, this is not communist. Democracy means that all citizens are equal. So all citizens have the same right to road space. For example, most cities give more space to park cars than to pedestrians and bicycles. Who decided this? Road space is the most valuable resource a city has, more than if we were to find oil or diamonds. The question is, how do we distribute road space between pedestrians, bicyclists, public transport, and cars? This is not a technical issue. This is a political issue. Not People with cars do not have more of a right to road space than children or people without cars. Moreover, I don't know of any constitution with, which includes parking as a constitutional right. So this issue, this, this concept of e equality, of democracy, uh, is fundamental when we are going to design new cities. And politicians will have to take care of uh, paying more attention to democracy, which by itself would be a powerful tool to change cities. Okay, thanks very much. Now, stay, stay on the line, as they say. Can I invite our uh, earlier speakers, Adam, Sanand, and Rick, to come and uh, join me out here on the panel? So, uh, we've got um, Enrique hovering in a slightly godlike way above us here, <laughs> in so many ways, and the more earthbound panelists with us, down with me, of course. So, uh, would anybody like to... Um, Ask a question. If it's a statement, make it short. And whether it's a statement or a question, short. So the gentleman here, can we get a second one lined up and a woman there? OK. Uh, do you want to aim it at anybody in particular? I mean, of our panel? <laughs> or do you just want to say something? Well, I would like to aim to all the panelists. OK. And um, um, one thing I'm surprised is that um, um, the the forthcoming changes of car technology has not been mentioned um, in a big way. Because I could see from the, um, the, the Shell book, uh, it's been mentioned there. And uh, potentially, um, there's a parallel between the car technology changes in the 20th century, emerging from a recession, and uh, 
the changes, possible changes in the 21st century, probably even bigger changes in terms of control technology, engines, and the level of comfort, and the level of service. And um, I would like the panelists actually to comment on the more positive side of how cars might actually help the smart cities rather than hinder it. That will certainly have... And before you sit down, though, do you mean things as radical as self-driving vehicles? Is that what you're talking about? Things where we kind of move out of the home and get in a pod and it takes us where we want to go? That well, kind of uh, a practical point that uh, Mayor Penalosa actually said about the cars kill children and uh, control technology now uh, is starting to, uh, to address that question. So cars not only not hit children, of course, but also the, don't hit other cars or, or other vehicles. Uh, so, and the, the, a myriad of changes, actually. I think the, the panel actually probably looked at more than I do. So <laughs> okay. I'd like them to actually to comment on this. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Enrique, perhaps I'll start with you. I mean, if, if cars were made better and less destructive, would you like them more? I love cars. I have nothing against cars. The problem is that uh, they are great if they are used to go to the countryside and maybe to go out at night. And uh, I think one of the things that will happen when cars become self-driven, for example, they will become less sexy, uh, less attractive. And so this perhaps will help people have uh, less cars. Cars also are noisy. Uh, a very wide roads tend to make an environment less uh, pleasant, but of course it would be it would be wonderful to have uh, cars which are assured that they will not crash against other cars or kill other or kill people. Uh, certainly. Okay, well, that sounds like um, a vote broadly in favour. Any you'd like to? like to say something? Uh, we, we certainly talk in, in quite a lot of detail about um, mobility as part of the scenario outlooks and there's, there's no question that new platforms, be they um, battery electric vehicles or, or even hydrogen vehicles, do play a massively uh, increased role in the energy system as, as, as we look out and uh, you're right, I neglected to mention that in the context of my, of my speech. I, whether or not that addresses directly uh, um, Enrique's points regarding um, issues of access um, in city areas, costs of uh, road use, costs of parking, um, whatever. Of course, there's going to be a balance in there somewhere. I think one interesting trend as well to, to, to throw in the to discussion is the behavioural change associated with um, a transition from owning stuff to having access to stuff. And certainly we see, uh, um, you know, with, with increased interest, the, the way in which uh, projects like Zipcar or, or Green Wheels, as we as we have in the Netherlands, becoming an increasingly uh, interesting phenomenon. I'm doubtless going to be shouted down for saying that I'm wrong about this, but 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 uh, Japan, I believe, is um, one example where the trend towards people reaching the age where they can learn to drive is showing exactly the opposite trend towards people not learning to drive um, um, or learning to drive, but then not wanting to own a vehicle either because of the cost or because, frankly, um, having access to it when you need it for what you need it for in short periods of time is far more desirable than than the cost of it sitting there, not not not. Um, um, doing anything other than depreciating massively and costing you vast sums of money to park in okay. city environments. All right, well, and let's yes, do something else. Yes. Briefly, I, I, think, I think the connection between the design of cars and the design of cities is a, is a very important one, um, needless to say. But here's a specific example. I, I showed some slides of uh, some cities in India which were designed to, to provide mutual shading, which means narrow street, so that it was cool even in very hot weather. So these are climatically influenced cities with, with narrow lanes where actually a degree of outdoor life can be lived even when the temperatures are very high. They're almost as if they're carved out of the ground. Now, the, one of the reasons given for the complete abandonment of this pattern of urbanism, which actually has many, many other advantages uh, than just, just, just the shading, is because of the car. And I think what I would love to see is uh, and, and the argument was given that, well, actually, you, know, you can't have fire engines going to these lanes. Just for safety, we've got to change these cities. And I think it's very odd that we design, we redesign and refurb, remodel cities and destroy them in order to accommodate a car rather than design a car 
to accommodate the city in which they are. And I would love to hear uh, news of the new technologies that are possible, designing far more diverse ranges of cars, which might be thin, for example. You can only go through the thinner spaces, um, apart from all the other technologies, fire engines and other vehicles that can actually deal with a sensible urban infrastructure rather than the other way around. Okay, very good. Now, uh, right, there's a woman somewhere here, and then a gentleman here, and then a woman there. So you're on, then the gentleman here, then the woman there. Thanks, Tony. I was really, um, Samantha Heath, I was really taken by Adam's point about go fast together quickly. Um, and I think that's where technology has to take us, go fast together quickly. Um, so um, going, going on from that particularly, I was more taken by Tony's brusque question that politicians are horrible and business is nice. Um, and we'd look at tax evasion with Starbucks, for instance, and Shell has had its fair chance of being bullied um, by people, etc., or bullying the other way around. So I wanted really to ask, um, go, go together quickly, what would democracy mean about how could we create a democracy where businesses and, and politicians and people could work together? So what would our favorite technology be that could drive that together more quickly. So I was thinking about a mobile phone where we get to vote, not on X Factor, but whether um, maybe a new parking consideration could happen or something. But what would your favorite technology that could get us faster, quicker would be? Down. How far would you be, sorry, pull my feet. How far would you prepare to let democracy go in this regard. I mean, we're pretty close to the point where everybody could vote on everything, and I suspect some of the things that you and I might not want, the public might want. I no, mean, no, how would you I, cope I, with that? No, I completely that? got that, and, and as you know, I, you and I sparred years ago on, on the issue of climate change and environmentalism, but I don't think it's about a stick. I think it's about having honest conversations with people about air quality and energy, and once we've given people, like, we all know that you lose is it 10 years of your life every stop on, you know, I mean, there's, there's a load of stuff we lose because of, of our environmentalism. So how far do we go? I think the provisor has to be if we know all of the facts. Okay. Birmingham, did Birmingham yeah. tell us something about that? <laughs> We've had two Birminghams, one that is not as Enrique yes. described it and yours. So did Birmingham help us here? Um, I, I, I don't know about Birmingham. Certainly I think the city is trying to find a, a way to do that. And I think through two different routes, the answer comes back to information. Um, I, I think many decisions are, are taken for, for two different sets of reasons. One is what we want to do and think is the right thing, and the second is the way that we're measured, because we're all measured one way or another. Um, I think um, the way that we're measured can change as that open data agenda makes progress. Um, I think it will take a lot of time and effort to make real progress because the thing that's not talked about enough is that good quality data costs money somewhere. You, you don't get good quality data for free. And understanding how we can make accurate, reliable, trustable data available is a journey that we're all on. Part of policy that can help that, and the government's actually doing a great job here, is setting out that in public sector procurement, a principle will be that the system we're procuring will make data openly available. That way the people supplying it know they've got to bake the cost of doing that into their, their quote. So I think that's an important um, element because it will mean that we can measure more sophisticated things than the, the flows of money that are generally what we spend time measuring. Um, and the second element is then addressing what people want to do because there are many, many cases of people doing, doing things not because it's the most financially um, worthwhile thing to do but because they strongly believe it's the right thing to do. And I think that's more about the agenda of storytelling that I was getting to at the end of my presentation. Enrique, you've been, you, are, you have been a politician and still aspire, I think, um, to be again. Uh, or have I'm been recently. <laughs> right. I mean, how do you, what do you make of the possibility of much greater data availability to give you a portal into what the public wants or to put it more crudely, to deliver more directly things the public wants, obviously moderated by you with your electoral legitimacy? Well, uh, just one brief uh, comment relative to the last question. I say, as I agree with Sunan, the important thing is uh, whether we're going to build cities for cars or for people. 
even if cars do not kill people, I don't think you would want cars in your greenways, crisscrossing your city. And this is, for example, an, a way where, where you could vote. I agree with you. More and more people can vote on many things. Uh, of course, when many people vote, it's difficult to make change because new ideas are never born with majority support. Uh, and uh, it's very easy to get people to get against change than to get people together for change. So I think even though more and more and more democracy will happen, hopefully people voting on many, many issues, even from their cell phones, I think politicians in the end will have to take risks. Uh, and they will have to take risk of being unpopular uh, because uh, new, new ideas and new visions will very rarely have full support for, of, of everybody uh, when before they are implemented. So uh, I think a real politician has a dream of what a society should be like and is willing to assume cost in order to achieve that dream for his society. Does anybody want to? Don't to right. No. Do you want to? The question was what piece of technology would make this more likely, is that right? Yeah. But uh, but but it, I'm intrigued that you you identified the dream piece of technology, because I, I don't know what what you think, but I would have thought that going far further together or faster uh, in the short term, you know, maybe you can go faster in the short term with technology, but you can't get further together with technology. That's you know, th th that is the techno I, I wouldn't have thought that was a technological answer that's needed here. It's something completely different. Okay. Take a gentleman here, then a uh, woman at the back. You've got a yeah, microphone, then a gentleman here after. This is probably more a question for Adam than anyone else, but happy to hear other, other um, comments. Um, we've spoken about an increasing global population of 70 million a year um, and the need to accommodate... Um, people in roughly, uh, the number was sort of eight cities the size of London every year. Now, cities require materials. They require steel, concrete, bricks, cement, aluminium, glass. Now, all of these are the most energy-intensive uh, materials. Um, and I, this is just the embedded energy in the, in, in, in the infrastructure. And I'm not even talking about uh, the process of putting it together, I'm not talking about the operational um, 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 energy required to, 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 you know, to run these, um, this infrastructure. So my, my simple question is, where's the energy going to come from to do this when we're already living in an energy-constrained world? Definitely want to no, I think, I think it's a, an, an entirely fair question, and, and rather than wax lyrical on the subject, hopefully you know, you'll... you'll take time to read what's uh, what, what's in the scenarios because we give two two possible views on that I mean the the, the issue of uh, living beyond one's means is is certainly something we've sought to tackle not just in terms of total energy impact but looking at some of the the, the political um, and social drivers around it there is no question that greater efficiency uh, in how uh, um, some of the materials that you've mentioned, which are the building blocks of, of, of cities that we're here talking about, um, can be improved. They've improved a lot in the last 50 years. We envisage in, in certainly one of our scenarios they can improve at least as much um, in the next 50, but, but, but the point you make is, is an excellent one. Um, on the issue of, of, of key resources between now and 2030, um, shortfalls in terms of energy, food and water will be between 40 and 50 percent. Um, which is absolutely staggering, and, and, and not to dismiss um, those who would uh, um, sit here this evening and, and talk about CO2, but the criticality of water shortage, particularly in the city context, is something that, that, that personally concerns me very greatly, and one which, which comes up um, time and time again with um, 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 you know, the conversations with our, own, um, um, with our own leadership. So I think it's a combination of efficiency, it's a combination of smarter planning, and, and, and I'm happy to talk offline and separately with you about some of the work we've done in China where we've seen particularly around the policy space how um, these things may be better managed if you focus in on, on, on certain sort of policy um, uh, dynamics. I, yeah. yeah I mean, I, 
not to get too, too glib about it, but I think there are some things that technology can do. I mean, we can't change the amount of energy that's incorporated in a piece of concrete, although you may be able to find some efficiencies, but certainly in systems such as, as transport, a huge percentage of, of van journeys, for example, the return journeys particularly, are, are empty. There's lots of capacity in the system that could be used more efficiently. Um, and so I think there are many, many opportunities to increase efficiency through the chain, though I think one of the challenges that you get to is the, the more efficiently you engineer those systems sometimes the more brittle that they can become so when they're disrupted the impact of those dis disruptions can be much much greater and I think you know we, we need to be cautious of that as we go down this route and I think it's just undeniable that growth in the world's population will be a significant challenge and if it doesn't slow down then at some point we will have a really un fundamental problem. Okay the woman at the back and I've, I'm going to run on just sort of five or ten minutes after eight, so those of you who think you'll never eat again, I promise I will finish soon after eight, but not instantly. Yeah. Hi. I'm interested in harnessing the data that flows off cities for, for change. Um, so my question is, how fundamental to change is the gathering of grassroots information about how people are using their communities? And, um, is this currently influencing system design? So maybe a question for Rick, but open to all, I think. Try and answer it very, very briefly. I, I think it's absolutely fundamental. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that crowdsourced data is the answer to everything, although it certainly has a very interesting role. W one of the challenges of crowdsourcing and volunteerism is that you can't really apply a service level to it. And so the, there is a limit to what it can be used to accomplish, but it's very powerful. But I think the, the concept I tried to explain in my, my talk of um, understanding how to build city information <laughs> infrastructures through discussion and through listening to grassroots, ground-up ideas. That's the way to build things that people will actually use, and I think it's a secret to that little things and big things idea um, that, that I try to get across. So I, I think it's fundamentally important, though only a part of a complex picture. Okay, well, let's keep moving guys, in order to get a maximum number of questions there, and then there's a chat next question here. So it's the microphone to that guy. Yeah, this guy here. Hi, um, I am from one of those Birmingham suburbs that needs to be torn, torn down, by the way. Um, uh, Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, yes. West Midlands, uh, yeah. But I want to ask, um, it seems to me that we've talked a lot about information, we've talked a lot about transportation, but I want to ask the panel about ways of working, because it seems to me that we all travel a long way in order to work as if we're working in a factory where we're increasing the number of pins manufactured in a very Adam Smith type fashion. But in fact, what we're doing is we're traveling a long way to sit in a, at a desk and lower our productivity by not only burning energy uh, to get to where we're going, but burning energy in another building we have to be in and then lowering our productivity because we're actually in a place that doesn't promote productivity in the first place. So it seems to me that, that, that the real benefits of the technology are what we're seeing here, a gentleman very far away able to talk to us all by means of communication and nothing more complicated than that. So I'd like to see what the panel has to say about means of working in the future city because I think that's a very important factor. Okay, I mean, presumably what you've effectively said there to some degree is that there must be good economic reasons for why they do behave in this inefficient way. Question? Uh, no? But there's social reasons that, that well, let's, let's see what the panel thinks. Sanan. Yeah, I think the changes of work patterns uh, enabled by digital technology is one of the most exciting and interesting things that's happening, uh, and happening in unexpected ways. The, the crisis of the office, the disappearance of the office, for example. Uh, if you go to the Royal Festival Hall on any weekday, you'll, I think there are maybe, as I've, I've counted at least 200 people uh, working as if it was their office. And now I think it's more. And I think that the wiring up of public space so that it becomes like a ubiquitous office space where you can work anywhere you want. I personally, actually, really like crowded, busy places with my laptop where I find the maximum privacy and focus and concentration. I don't know why. Maybe I'm strange, but maybe others are as strange as me. But none of these actually do away entirely and cannot with the need for person-to-person -person communication. We can talk to Enrique, uh, but if we were really working together, I think it'll be necessary at some point to see what his hands are doing and how he holds his body and, you know, what he smells like. 
And, and you know, I think that... Is he even better looking? King in real life. Is he, is he, he is, even no, better I know, looking? I you know, I don't know. But, you know, these things, and this is why I think the design of space and place is very important, because I think that, in a sense, architecture liberated from the purely transactional element of exchanging information needs to move on to supporting emotional exchange and transactions. And I think, therefore, it's a quite a challenge for architecture. But I don't think it's the answer to all problems of travel. Maybe, however, as much as 80%. Anybody like, yes, I mean, feel, for Enrique, if you're, f do feel free to chip in, uh, uh, other than whether you prefer like to have been here this uh, evening. Okay, one, one, uh, one comment, and uh, it is about where will all these cities that are going to be built, where are they going to be built? When a road is built, the, it is designed the shortest way from point A to point B from Birmingham, uh, Britain to London, the shortest way. Because then if there is one curve too much, the lorries, I mean 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 lorries will have to go around and that will cost a lot of money in time. So there is only one possible way to do a road. Maybe there are two or three alternatives, but not 300 or 3,000. Now, when we are going to build cities, cities cannot be just built where some landowner decides to urbanize. Because even if people work with their computers and all that, in fact, many people will still, majority of people will move. They will go for work or for study or for recreation. So I think this is an enormous challenge. There is a story that was published last year in Mexico and how between 1980 and 2010, the population in most Mexico is city by city, but in general is in most Mexican cities increased by about 100%, while the area of the city increased by around 700%. And if, if, if property of land around cities is private, the cities are going to grow in terrible places. This will have a huge environmental cost. In the developing countries where the land around cities is private, government does not have the tools to control where cities will grow. And this is going to have huge quality of life and environmental costs. I think cities should grow in the right place. And the way we are going, we are doing terribly, terribly bad. Okay. Do you want to add something, Rick? You look as if you did. Very briefly, one more I, question. I, I use virtual work technology all the time, have done for, for years and years and years. Um, and social media an awful lot as well. And the paradox is it makes me want to travel more. Um, <laughs> and Enrique has just been introduced by this technology to 250 people who now have a, a reason to think, I want to go and speak to him in person because I've got this great <laughs> idea and I want to see how he reacts to it in, in person. Yeah. This is the challenge. That's what, that's what happens. The, the, the theory I, I look to here is Jeffrey West's theory of urban systems. It basically says as cities get bigger, they speed up due to the interactions and that will want us to travel more no matter how much collaboration technology we have. And so we need to deal with that. Productive, yeah. mm. Okay, now, and say, yes, yeah, sorry. I'm to ask the panel to reflect on a, a bit of a paradox, actually. It's one that was raised just across the way here about um, how you work with the fact that all these cities that are going to be built um, embody energy in their material. Um, obviously, the solution to that is you make your cities last twice as long, and that halves their energy cost in terms of the embodied energy. Um, however, if you're going to do that, there's a risk of lock-in that society is evolving very rapidly, Samantha is going to have us all voting by mobile phone, uh, new politics is going to emerge. How do we square the more rapid change that is going to come with social, economic and political systems with the need to have cities that actually just last longer? Okay, well, that's a really good final question, so I'm going to ask all of the speakers briefly to respond to it. Um, go on, I don't know. This is sort of a uh, um, tiebreaker test, isn't it, in a, in a, in a quiz? I mean, the, the, um, the, the foresight which led the development of London's sewer system to accommodate a, a, a population of the size of today, you know, plus or minus a few sort of hiccups of the ageing infrastructure and what have you, is, is the kind of mindset which um, 
I, I fear as somebody who has no background in urban planning nor, nor anything other than a massive interest in it is, is what's lacking in terms of an awful lot of, lot of urban development. And, and obviously I've said that in the context of, of work done in China. Um, I think when you look at your, your point relating to uh, the life of buildings, the tenure of buildings, yes, absolutely. But capturing something which is um, about the, the, the needs and capacity of London's sewer system in the context of buildings which will last for the future, which can be... Are you still there? <laughs> um, which will have a serviceable life, will have the flexibility to change, um, grow, and shrink with the needs of that city, as the case may be, is very important. I think at looking at the ways in which policy uh, um, interfaces better around the size of plots you carve up and what you do with them to introduce, as Enrique's talked about, much more mixed use, a much uh, 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 more interesting interaction between uh, um, pedestrian usage and, 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 and road vehicle usage um, is all very, very important. To me, this comes back to the fundamental point about um, policy working better, and Enrique's talked a little bit about politicians being prepared to make uh, unpopular decisions. I think that's a very important part um, of it too. Uh, um, I think I could probably go on for another five minutes, but I guess you don't want me to. No, but thank you for, thank you for noticing, Sanand. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Nothing if not observant. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the paradox is that uh, we're designing cities to be less resilient than they used to be. I think that the uh, pre-industrial city, actually not even pre-industrial, pre-20th century, pre-mid-20th century city uh, was capable of extraordinary uh, adaptability. We can still design buildings with extraordinary adaptability and versatility, and I think that's the answer. I think there's, there's actually, it's not that mysterious. I think that the, the, uh, the vectors that force us to do otherwise are to do with land values, to do with uh, short-termist ideas about return on investment, the entanglement of the property, the whole of the property world with, with you know, placing of money in a credit transactions around the world, half of them probably not licit. And that world is actually stopping us building resilient cities, which technologically we can do without any question at all. I, I very briefly Rick. agree with both, both of these comments. I think information can allow f flexible systems to be created. And there's lots of innovation going on in transport at the moment about using the resources and the infrastructures that we have to transport things more efficiently. But I think the fundamental thing is that adaptability of, of the built environment. That's much more important answer to this question than information technology. Enrique, you are getting the last yeah. word across the ocean. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, I think that uh, we still have a great challenge as to how should the ideal cities be. I think we, we tend to assume that nothing very radical can be done. And where, where should these cities grow? Because this is going to have huge implications in terms of energy use, in terms of quality of life and all this. So I think uh, much is to be done yet in terms of, of radically different designs and, uh, and to question more where will this growth that is going to happen will happen. And also, which are going to be the political, the government tools in order to once we once we have a once we agree of, about how and especially where cities should grow to really achieve this because i think in most of the developing world except where go land is owned by government cities tend to grow mostly where all experts would think they should not grow okay well it's a great way to end okay well all I'll say, just to try and bring all of this together in about one and a half minutes at the end of this evening, which is certainly for me being uh, full of interesting ideas, is that we clearly are on the brink of a move to a much smarter way of operating cities. That is, we have the tools at our disposal. But of course, you know, here we are in a year which in London is... Uh, celebrating the 150th year of the underground, which was pretty radical technology in its time. Uh, and we've seen the evolution of cars and roads and telegraph and the telephone. And at any point, we are seeing these kind of radical changes going on. 
Whether this is a more radical one, well, we'll find out looking back on that was another Intelligence Squared event in 30 or 40 years. So there will be many, many more between now and then. So I'd just like to uh, conclude the evening by thanking uh, Adam, Sanand, Rick, and of course Enrique uh, in Bogota. Uh, I'd like to thank Shell for their uh, participation this evening. Uh, but most particularly, thank all of you, the audience, for coming, for your questions and your patience. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you.